Um, and I'm, I'm super excited to introduce our next speaker. For those of us who are engineers by training, uh, especially in the software world, Kent Beck really needs no introduction. Uh, he has uh, been involved with some of the most important uh, movements in software development, including patterns and extreme programming. Uh, one of the founders of the Agile, signers of the Agile Manifesto, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but he has also been uh, a very important part of my own journey, uh, both as an engineer and in Lean Startup. We were recounting earlier one of the very first webinars I ever did uh, about Lean Startup. Somebody was chatting on the webinar as Kent Beck. Uh, we all just assumed, I actually had to stop the webinar and be like, that's not the real Kent Beck, is it? And we were joking, and I was like, oh, yeah, right. It's like Muhammad Ali's on the webinar, very funny. But it was in fact him, and it has, that was the beginning of a really productive dialogue. He was one of the very first speakers we had at the very first edition of this conference a few years later, a few years ago, and now a few years later, he finds himself coaching engineering at a tiny little company called Facebook. So if you would, welcome Kent Beck to the stage. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I'm told I have a triangle that I'm supposed to be in, so I'll uh, probably go to the edges of it just to drive the AV guy nuts. <laughs> Sorry about that. We all deal with nervousness in our own ways. So once upon a time, uh, there was a family, and they, uh, they moved out into the wilderness. We won't go into the backstory, but let's just assume this happened. So they moved out into the wilderness, and they built a little shelter, and they got there they, they had their shelter built, and they had some place to sleep, but then they thought, how are we going to eat? And uh, just then, out of the woods appeared an old man, an old man with a banjo on his back and a, and a beard on his face, and he said, to eat, you have to hunt. And they said, well, well how do you hunt? He said, don't worry, I'll show you. So over the next few days, the old man taught the family how to make spears and snares and bows and arrows and said, this is, this is how you hunt. And they think, oh, great, fantastic, because they lived in such a fertile part of the world, it was easy to get all the food that they needed for a while. Over time, though, the hunting got harder and harder, and they noticed that they'd spend more of their day hunting there were some nights when there wasn't anything to eat. And in fact, they were starting to get a little slim and the belts were starting to tighten. And then, what do you do? And just then, the old man appeared out of the woods again and he said, in order to eat, you have to gather. They said, gather? What is this gather stuff you're talking about? He said, I'll show you. So over the next few days, the old man showed them which seeds of the grasses were easiest to uh, harvest, which plants on the ground you could dig up roots and eat from, how to clear out more of the forest so that there was more food to eat. And they said, oh, thank you very much. Now, now we're set. And they were for quite a while. In fact, they were so successful at gathering that they sort of forgot their hunting skills. And the the bows and the spears rotted away. And then came the day when there was a crop failure. The frost came, not unlike the frost we're having today, and, uh, and there, there were no roots to dig up and there were no seeds to gather. And again, they were starting to get hungry. And just in time, because this is a story, the old man came out of the woods with his banjo, and said, ah, in order to eat, you have to hunt and gather. I thought, oh, okay. So they reminded themselves of their old hunting skills. They retained their skills at gathering food. And when the crops failed, they could still eat. When the hunting was bad, they had the food that they gathered. And uh, a few years later, things were going very well, but the old man came back one last time. And they said, they said to him, Now, <clears throat> when we first got here and we just had a little hut in the middle of the woods, you told us that to eat we had to hunt. And he said, Yes. 
Because if you'd, if you'd tried to do anything else, you didn't have time to, to lay out crops and so on. You had to eat now. He said, oh. But then later you told us that to eat we had to gather. And he said, well, yes. Because at that point, game was getting scarce. There wasn't as much to eat. And uh, it, you weren't going to be able to just hunt. And they said, huh. And then you came back the third time and you told us that in order to eat, we had to hunt and to gather. So what's that about? He says, well, usually gathering works, but when it doesn't work, you have to be able to hunt as well. And they said, well, so are we hunters? Are we gatherers? Are we hunter-gatherers? He said, we're just going to leave that to the anthropologists to figure out. <laughs> and they said, the anthro what? And poof, the old man and his banjo disappeared in a cloud of purple smoke and were never seen again. What does this have to do with engineering? <laughs> when I thought of the story, I asked myself the same question. Oftentimes, that's my process. Like, I'll just think of some crazy idea, and then I'll, whoa, that, that's a, that can't possibly be a good idea. But, you know, that's the best moment, right? Good ideas are worthless because somebody else has figured them out. It's bad ideas that turn out to be good ideas that are really cool. <laughs> Unfortunately, this means that you have to cultivate failure because most of the bad ideas are, in fact, bad ideas. <laughs> but if you just make a habit of saying, well, this is stupid, how quickly can I prove to myself that this is stupid? You, you get some real insights out of that. So, <clears throat> we all have, more or less, three billion seconds on the planet. And I hate wasting those seconds. As an engineer, and that's how I, I come to, to the Lean Startup community is, is as an engineer. I'm a builder. I like making things. I recognized 15, 20 years back, perhaps, that just making things is not enough. That there is this build, measure, learn cycle, and building for its own sake while it's a lot of fun, is not a way to keep groceries on the table. So build, <clears throat> building as part of a build, measure, learn cycle, for me, that's my goal. Um, I wrote this book uh, uh, called Extreme Programming, and uh, uh, people have used that as a weapon, which I was kind of uh, sad about. But there's, once you publish the book, if somebody wants to use it to shim up a table or hit somebody, there's really nothing you can do about it at that point. <laughs> that text editor has not been invented yet. <clears throat> That's a weird idea, but I'll get back to that later when I'm done talking to you all. Okay, so, <clears throat> so here we have three billion seconds plus or minus on the planet. I hate wasting it. As I get older, I hate wasting it even more. But what I notice is uh, that uh, dogma sets in. And, uh, and this is a problem of success. The, the advantage that a complete and utter failure has is that they don't think that they know things that aren't true. As soon as you start being successful, you start believing things that aren't true because we're all really good at pattern matching. We all have these biases that says, well, you know, if I, if I put the yellow sock on first and then the blue, you know, I'm, then I meet interesting people when I have mismatched socks. Well, that one may be true. But um, you, you make all these correlations, you think, well, I'm a programmer, so I program in this way, and then I was successful, so programming in this way caused my success. That's bad enough. But then you go around and start telling other people, well, you should program in this way too. That's pretty bad. But then when you start telling other people that they should program that way too, there's zero information value. By that time, it's all completely gone. And that's where the waste comes in. 
people think they have the way to program figured out, the way to contribute to these BMLs, and they don't realize that there are lots of, there's a lot of context to what it means to engineer to maximize learning. Sometimes that means that you, you do what would be considered proper engineering. Careful, thoughtful design moving in little tiny steps. Cleaning the code up as you go along. And sometimes that's the, that is, in fact, the way to maximize learning. But that's only one way. There's a lot of context around that. It's not always the way to maximize learning. <clears throat> and so that's what I'll be talking to, uh, to some of you about later this afternoon, assuming you weren't frightened off by the story and the guy with the banjo and stuff, is what that really means for engineering. What is this cycle? And it, it's a typical cycle. It just happens over and over again. Team gets together, they hack up some stuff really fast, they learn, they get successful, then the product starts to blow up, and there's this huge chaotic transition. And usually the, the success scenario is you, you hire a bunch of proper engineers at that point, uh, all of the, the hacker guys go someplace else, or girls, my apologies. I'm, I'm still learning about this, but uh, I'm working on it. All of those, the, the, the original hackers leave. It's a huge, crazy time. Now you have proper engineers. Things go along smoothly, and then you start losing customers to a competitor, to a change in conditions, and you've forgotten the skills that got you customers in the first place. That's a cycle. It plays out over and over and over again. And so that's what I want to, that's what I'm going to be talking about this, this afternoon is what's the cycle? How do you identify that you're in the cycle? What do you do to get out of it if you want to waste fewer of those few precious seconds that you have on the planet? So um, I uh, invite some of you, but not all, because that would be terrible for the other speakers, to come and see me right here this afternoon to talk about how uh, engineering works inside of a, of a lean startup. So thank you very much.